In this video, I hope to simplify gain staging for you once and for all and give you the truth about proper gain staging in the mix. This is a super hot topic in the online audio community right now. People asking, how hot should my tracks be? Should I normalize everything down to minus 18 dB or some other level before I start mixing? I get asked all the time about my levels for mixing and about proper gain staging, and people seem really worried about it. For the most part, this is all nonsense, or at best, blown way out of proportion. Better gain staging might make a small difference in the quality of your mixes, but it is not the thing that's gonna take your work from amateur quality to pro the way that a lot of online vloggers and bloggers are claiming out there right now. It's just much ado about nothing. I'm gonna show you the ridiculously simple way that I gain stage and manage levels in my mixes, but first I wanna explain a little bit about why I think this whole gain staging craze is nonsense and bust a few of the myths surrounding it. Note that I'm talking about in the box mixing here. So that's where we'll start. See, back in the day with analog recording to tape and consoles, proper gain staging basically meant using amplifiers such as preamps or faders or knobs on consoles and outboard gear, using those effectively to introduce the least amount of noise possible. See, in analog recording, you used to want to record as hot as possible in order to maximize the signal to noise ratio. You see in tape or analog gear, there's a default noise floor that exists, the low level noise or hiss on the gear. And so if you record too quiet, then that means later on, you're gonna have to turn up the gain on that track or turn up the fader on the console, which is not only gonna bring up the signal that you recorded, but it's also gonna bring up all of the noise floor from the gear itself. So you would naturally want to record as hot as possible on those mediums so that there's a way bigger difference between the actual signal you're recording and the noise floor. So let's bring this old mentality into the modern digital recording era with DAWs and basically gain staging is a lot simpler for us now. We just have to record on the way in with a solid signal, conservative enough that we're not pushing it into the red and clipping on the way in and you'll be fine. There's no need to record as hot as possible anymore. You might as well leave lots of headroom because once you do clip, you can't go back on that. And this isn't tape anymore. We're not trying to push it as hot as possible to get the least amount of noise or to saturate uh, the converter like you would tape. And no, I'm not gonna give you a set of numbers to shoot for when you're recording because I think there's already enough rules and enough hype around this online. So I don't really wanna add to that mentality. But just know this, don't record so low that you can barely see it on the screen but don't record so hot that you're clipping. End of story. Once your signal is converted from analog to digital in your DAW, you can boost it and turn up the fader as much as you want without introducing any more noise. Now this leads us into another issue surrounding this whole gain staging topic, and that's the idea that you should keep your faders as close to zero or as close to unity as possible. Now again, this is left over from the old days when we were recording and mixing on consoles. You see on consoles, the faders used amplifiers to attenuate or boost the signal. And basically, as the further you got away from zero or unity point on that fader, the more noise was introduced. So engineers would try to record with their input gain at levels that would allow them to have a roughly balanced mix with all the faders at zero so that they didn't have to move them too far away from unity and introduce more noise. This is completely irrelevant now. The faders in your DAW do not introduce any more noise to the signal. And the, the other argument for this is that when your faders are closer to the top or more at, closer to unity in the DAW, then you're gonna have more resolution, more finer control over the level of your faders. Now, this is true, but let's be honest, who cares? In Pro Tools and I'm sure in all other DAWs, I can just simply hold Command on the keyboard while I move the fader and have ultimate fine control over the level adjustment, no matter where the fader is. It just doesn't matter. Okay, let's talk about gain staging with plugins now. Now, a lot of the hype around this started when people started claiming that the analog model plugins sounded better with an input level at minus 18 dB because that mimicked the signal level that the original analog gear would have been optimized for. Now, there is some truth to this, and you'll find in the manuals from plugins like Slate Digital and Waves, that they do recommend this level as a starting point, but this is something that I never paid attention to before and I pretty much ignore it now. See, even if there is some truth to this, 
the plugin companies clearly aren't that worried about it because the most they do is include a little paragraph in the manual that most people are never going to read. And do you really think that these plugin companies would design a plugin that's going to sound bad at levels that most everyone works with in a DAW? It just doesn't make any sense. Here's how I use plugins. I insert it on the track, I do my processing, and if the input signal looks like it's too hot, I turn down the input knob on the plugin, or I use clip gain or trim to actually trim down the audio track. And if the output is clipping, wait for it, I turn down the output on the plugin. By the way, with a lot of these analog model plugins, you can actually push the input and the output on purpose. Like on the SSL channel, I'll often have it clipping on the output a little bit on tracks like drums because it just adds a little bit of aggression and edge to it. Like everything else in mixing, ultimately you need to use your ears. So that means even if you see a red light once in a while on one of your plugins, if it sounds good, if you like the way it sounds, and if you're not hearing obvious nasty distortion or artifacts that you don't like, then it's fine. Just don't worry about it. And if you are hearing things you don't like, or it just freaks you out to see the red light, just turn it down. Now, before I actually show you my ridiculously simple gain staging process on the screen, I just want to make one more point. And without getting too scientific on this, just know that your DAW, no matter what you're using, has a ton of headroom inside it. All you need to worry about is that you're not clipping on the way in while you're recording and that you're not clipping on the final output. In between those two stages, you have tons of room. And even if you see the red light on an individual channel that's clipping or a bus that's clipping, that doesn't mean the audio is actually getting degraded in any way. There is a ton of room above that. Now here's proof on that. So there's some stems here, drums, bass, guitar, and vocal. They're pretty hot, it's just barely clipping there, but now what would happen if we pushed all of these faders up quite a bit? So now we're going to be clipping. That's obviously sounding distorted there, but watch what happens when I just turn down the master fader. So I'm not changing the output of these faders here at all, I'm just turning down the master fader. It's totally clean. So the clipping is not happening behind the scenes and the actual summing of those tracks. It's only happening on the final output to the converters. Now again, if I put this back up at zero where it's clipping and put on a trim plugin, I can just turn down the trim and again, it's gonna be clean. So again, just worry about the input and the output, everything in between. If you're getting the red lights and you're clipping, just turn it down, it's okay. Okay, so now I'm going to show you in real time how I actually gain stage in my mix. So these are actual files I've received to mix. This is real world stuff. I'm gonna drag them all in here and see what we got. So here's what I do, ready? Kick in, kick out, those look good. This snare top track, that's a little bit hot. Let's bring that down a bit. Snare bottom track, that could actually come up a tiny bit. Toms look okay. Our hi-hat track here is very low. Let's bring that up. That should be good. Some of these tracks are out of order, but we'll just keep going. So here's a synth track that's a little low. Let's bring that up. Here's a China track that's very low. Let's bring that up. We'll bring that up near the hi-hat as well. Here's another pad. I am doing this completely visually. Now, that might be weird to you, that might be surprising, that might seem wrong. I'm not looking at numbers, I'm not seeing what it's peaking at, um, but here's the thing. I've been mixing for many, many years, I've been using this DAW for many years, and honestly, I just know what stuff should look like on the screen in order, in order to end up with the levels that I want, in order to get the levels that I want in plugins for the settings that I commonly go to, and even just what I want the fader to be at and where the master level is going to end up being in the end. So this is honestly it. I just go through like this. Super low signal, turn it up. These look okay. Bass tracks, uh, maybe a tiny bit hot. And again, this is just experience. This is just knowing that when the waveform looks like that on the screen, it's probably going to be a little bit too hot or too quiet. I mean, if we solo this, 
again, visually, I knew that that waveform, that's going to end up basically kind of hitting right where the meter turns from green to yellow in Pro Tools, and that's basically where I like my stuff to be. Done. That's it. There's no fussing over numbers and peak levels and any rules like that, and it's just totally manageable and conservative levels. I know I can insert a bunch of plugins on there and it's not going to clip. And if it does, remember, all I got to do is just turn down the input knob or turn down the output knob on the plugin. It's not a big deal. And by the way, if you run into the problem where you get halfway through a mix and your master fader is clipping, then it's super simple. Again, you got two options. You can just turn down the master fader like I showed you a few minutes ago. Or most DAWs, like Pro Tools, has the all group by default. You can just turn that on and just turn down all the faders at the same time. And that's going to be fine. That's going to be the easiest way for you to free up some more headroom on your master fader. It's going to keep their relationship intact. It's not going to change your mix, but you'll free up some headroom on the output. That's it. Super easy. All right. I really hope that this video is a relief for you. Stop stressing about gain staging. To sum it all up, just don't clip on the way in and don't clip on the final output. And if it's red, turn it down. I've been recording and mixing professionally for over 10 years now, including for label releases. And I have never worried about measuring my levels or my plugin input levels or all of the stuff that everyone is freaked out about online. It doesn't have to be that complicated. It's actually pretty easy and common sense. So let me say it once and for all. Setting all of your tracks to minus 18 dB or some other arbitrary level is not going to make amateur mixes sound professional. This is not the problem with your mixes or with anyone else's. So I want you to rid yourself of all of these fears because really that's how this whole thing is coming across online. It's just about this fear of having the wrong levels in your DAW. And I want you to just ignore that now. You can completely disregard any further conversations that you see about gain staging and actually get on with mixing and get on with the stuff that actually makes your mixes sound better. Now, if that sounds good to you, then I think we are seeing eye to eye here. And I think you'd enjoy the book I wrote called Mixing Heavy Music. And I've decided to make it free for you for watching this video. So click on the link in the description below, just put in your email address there and I will send you the entire book for free so that you can get my best mixing advice tailored for heavy music that will actually make your mixes sound more professional. Leave a comment below on this video. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic and make sure you're subscribed to the channel so that I can share more recording and mixing tutorials with you in the future. All right. Thanks for watching. See you again soon.